when Israel Adesanya fought uh, Pahaya for the second time in Miami. I specifically requested not to do that fight. I don't think that Jake Paul is a true fighter. Till he's had his ass sat down in the canvas, only then will we see what he's made of. Look how far good they are already. Look at them. I'm gonna fucking crack Jake's nose. A lot of people want to or think they can be a referee. Fucking everybody. I mean, if it's none of my business, it's none of my business. But like, what's the most you've ever been paid for refing? Leon Edwards. You've never saw me referee Leon Edwards uh, in the UFC, and you never will. Yo. What's up, everybody? Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Overdogs Podcast. Uh, super grateful to be here. Super grateful to, you know, have this holiday. It's a holiday for me right now. This episode will come out. It'll probably be a different t day. But uh, shout out to you and your family. Um, we got a great guest on today. Mark Goddard is going to be checking in with us. Um, the British are coming. So, <laughs> oh, I'm lonely. My boys, they're not here right now. Ice Bags, I don't think he's going to make it today. Uh, Mac Malley should be here. And, um, you know, shout out to the squad, the team. I've been training like crazy for Jake. I feel like... Uh, I mean, I mean, you know, Gohan is, is, he got soft, bro. His mama made him go to school. There he is. There's Mac Malley. What's up, dog? What's up? What's up, boys? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, you know, we got some good questions for Mark Goddard today. Uh, if you don't know who Mark is, you're going to find out. Uh, he's a UFC ref. Been there refing for a long time. I think I had a note that said like 12 to 15 years or something like that. Or Yeah, 15 years MMA referee. Uh, those guys work a lot, man. Every weekend Dude, they're traveling with the, the UFC, the referees, the people. And they, ref, they don't just ref UFC. They ref... No. All KSW, professional fights, cage warriors, like, karate all combat, over the world, Bellator. dude. I've had Mark God. I've had the pleasure of fighting uh, in the ring in the octagon, and Mark Goddard be the ref before, so that's pretty cool. I sat and talked with him. Do you have a favorite ref? No, I mean, I mean, shout out. I mean, all those guys, man. Mark Goddard's a really good one because he, he, but. The thing is, like, you know, refs got to have certain fighters that they like because, like, I got to be one that they like because, like, I don't like the ref to get involved. I yeah. just want the ref I want the ref to sit back and have the best seat in the house and, and watch me go to work. So my, my guy, Andrew Glenn, as well. Hey, there he is. What's, What's up, up old chap? How you doing? <laughs> How you doing, Mike? I'm doing very well, sir. Pleasure to talk with you. Thanks for coming on, man. Nice to see you guys. How's how's the holiday over there for you? Which holiday? Today <laughs> is a holiday for us. It is the 4th of oh, July you, here. In, in you the mean States. Independence Day? Independence yeah. Day. You're yes. welcome. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, man. The British, The British are coming. They left us alone. They said they said we can have it, man. Mark, we got I got some good facts on you, man. You've been a a, a referee for fifteen years uh, in in mixed martial arts, and did you start out as a pro ref? I've been a referee for twenty, Mike. Jeez. Okay, get your facts right, Jazz. My producer <laughs> missed that one. I, I uh, think, I th yeah, I, I yeah, I first refereed in two thousand and four. It's twenty years. It's probably going off. Maybe they're going off the sure dog thing because there's like a there's a database on there for for referees. So if he's going off there, that's 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 fine. But um, yeah, my this is actually 2024 is my twentieth year as a ref. I mean, I've been in the sport. I was fortunate enough to have been in the sport for well 25 years now. I was here at the the beginning in the UK when MMA first crossed over. Um, in answer to your question, as as my first foray into refing was completely by accident, which I, I believe is the best things in life. You know, I, I was lucky mm -hmm. enough to find my calling. 
um, 20 years ago, uh, as I say, I went to an, I was supposed to fight at the event. I got injured and the promoter was a friend of mine and I turned up and he said uh, something happened to one of the other refs and he's like, you got a ref? And I was like, what? fuck, what? You know, didn't have time to think about it. And, um, you know, a lot of people ask me that question anyway, how did I start? So it was totally by accident. I had no choice in the matter. And 20 years later, here we are. Lot, thousands of fights you've been in. Thousands, yeah. I've watched. L literally, thousands. Literally, literally, literally thousands of fights. I don't know how many, but it's, yeah, into the several thousands. That's incredible. You were, you were the first UK referee to the UFC? Correct. I mean, officially, yes. At, at, at the time when the UK first came back, I mean, the, the, there's a long-winded story about, you know, the, the, they were talking to me for a while, but because I was still competing, it was kind of a problem to them, which I understood. I first started refereeing for the UFC in 2008. So I'm now, I'm 16 years with the UFC alone. So the 15 years plus one is just with the UFC. Um, I, I've been with a I've been with a guy since 2008, um, and there was uh, me and a colleague of mine called Leon Roberts, who mm -hmm. uh, Leon doesn't ref anymore, but he was a very good ref, very established ref, um, and they uh, they picked us both up uh, at the same time when they first came over to. It was when Michael Bisping won the Ultimate Fighter, and the UFC went out on that massive expansion, particularly in Europe, and everything was mm -hmm. kind of like. Right place, right time. Wow, amazing. I mean, um, damn, what was I going to say? Uh, do you think, um, oh, no, I'm, I'm going to save that one. I don't want to do that one yet. Um, be, before you came on, I was just talking about, you know, because he asked me, my boy Mac Malley here asked me, he's like, do I have a favorite ref? And, you know, I've actually had a, a chat with you. We were sitting in UK having breakfast and... Um, you know, you're and I think you're the type of ref that lets the fighters fight. And I was saying, you know, these refs got to have some favorite fighters because I'm a guy who just I want the ref to just not get involved. And I just want to fight. And then, you know, he just stops it when I get the win. So, you know, do you have some favorite fighters that you like to ref for? Who are who are some of your favorites that you have ref or even some of the favorite fights that you've ref? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, when it comes to fav look, yeah, you build a rapport with certain fighters for sure throughout the years. Um, you know, obviously, sometimes some fighters don't necessarily get a get along with refs. Um, normally, it's because they've lost, <laughs> and then sometimes if they're going to try and pin it to, to to the referee, but that's very very few and far between. Um, honestly, like, you know, when people talk about reputations and stuff, and like you said, you know, we've had some pretty... F you were commenting on the flip-flop game. That's what it was in, in, in the UK. I can't remember which show it was. And I don't think you were fighting them. I think you, you were either a guest fighter or you were cornering somebody or something. Oh. I'm not sure if you were fighting at Maybe the time. Maybe in Poland? Maybe, yeah. One, it could, yeah could, okay. like, you know, it could be anywhere. But okay. in terms of, look, obviously as a ref... When it comes, when it's fight time, of course I have no favourites, you know, just despite what the fucking internet says. But we'll get on to that, I'm sure. I have no favourites. I have no dog in the race for, you know, from being there. You know, <clears throat> I don't just referee from from the mind; it's from the heart as well. All I want is two guys or two girls to do what they're paid to do, have the fight of their life, keep me out of it. I don't want to say a word. That's enough, you know. We we. A good referee does not want to get involved with the fight, but we don't decide that. You know, the fighters do. And, yeah, over the years, I've had some great rapport with fighters, you know. Obviously, especially in the UK, because I grew up with the scene. We were here from day one. So there was pe even in the UFC, there's people who had fought, people who had beat, people who had beat me. Obviously, we, we take ourselves out of those fights. And kind of ev every... Every event I would go to, there was a relationship, you know, because obviously the, the scene was pretty small back then. And, um, yeah, so by and large, there was, there's a whole host of fighters that I have, you know. I respect every fighter that, that gets in there, obviously, but there is there are some relationships that develop. You know, when I say a relationship, it's kind of a rapport. 
you get an understanding. You know yourself, Mike, as a, I'll, I'll use you as an example. We had a good rapport. You know, it's it's everything for a, for a fighter to be able to trust a referee, right? If somebody walks into the... Nothing fills me with, a, a, you know, a bigger sense of pride when you walk into the certain arenas or dressing rooms and the fighter is happy to see you. That, that That's always a good thing, for sure. Hey, thanks to our sponsors at Overdogs.Bet, the only place on the planet with exotic MMA prop bets. Sign up now for beta and free play. Please be sure to subscribe, like, and comment. Because the king of violence told you to do so. Show some love to the Overdogs podcast, baby. Yes, sir. I mean, I got a lot of respect for you, man. You carry yourself. All you referees, man, you guys are a different breed. You guys hold yourselves upright. Uh, you stand tall and, and uh, you don't take no BS. You know what I mean? You guys uh, you guys are in control when you're in there. And, you know, so so uh, what's up, Mac? You got some – I know you got some uh, some questions for – the yeah, legend. just kind of brainstorming. We're touching on some important ones right off the bat. What's up, Mark? Haven't said that person. How you What's doing, up, buddy? Though, bro? Um, I mean, I got a bunch of different questions, but okay, so favorite fighters, like you don't have to name any names. Are there any fighters you have a big problem with? Like, you know, we had Dominic Cruz with the, uh, you know, <laughs> booze and cigarettes. And, you know, I'm not ripping on Dom, but... Do you got what's your worst one? You got any any bad uh, beef with any fighters? They see you around. They go, I hope he's not fucking roughing my fight. On a personal front, <clears throat> I tell you, mate, I have beef with no one. You know, yeah. I'm, old, I'm, a, I'm, an, I'm an old head in this game. Um, mm -hmm. I'm 50 years old. You know, I've been doing this a long time. It goes back to what we were saying before. Unfortunately, you know, the, the fighting is an emotional business, <clears throat> and I understand that. And com com coming with emotional business is that at certain points, things will not go a fighter's way. Now that could be down to a, that could be down to an official or an error of judgment. Um, but obviously, it's, that's the last thing on our minds. So from from a personal point of view, yeah, put it this way: when I when I retire from refing and I write a book of memoirs. My my best tweets are all the unsent ones. I'll save them as drafts. Yeah. <laughs> but 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 honestly, look, I, I'm there to be like like I said, it comes from the heart. What I do, you know, in this sport, I've grew up in it. You know, I, I've competed, I've toured. I'm still, I'm an active martial artist always, first and foremost. Um, and the last thing, the last thing on earth, is for me to have any form of resilience or or ill no, no, nothing fills me with more dread if i'm assigned to work at a certain event or sometimes we you know like i said the common sense and experience tells you that if there was a, a past indiscretion with a fighter or, or something that they weren't happy with there's always other refs there so we just i'll just say to the you know i'm not going to do that fight you can have um you know you can declare beforehand that there could be a clash of interest stuff like that it just comes down to the individual, you know, like I said, without being too long-winded about it. Common sense and experience yeah. counts for a lot. And uh, I'm just there to look after these people. I, I love what I do immensely. And, um, yes, I don't, want, I don't want any hassle. Yeah. Well, so, so, like, I don't know how to ask this one, but, like... i tell let's you say, real quick, I mean, Mark, you look... No 50, diddy, bro. Yeah, you look dude. great. For 50 years old, bro. I thought I you were like 38. Yeah, same. That, mate, that must just uh, be, that's just, that. maybe that's Scottish eating blood. good. Scottish blood and whiskey. It's a good preservative. Uh. Yeah, let's go. Well, Dude, so, like, if you do, let's say you do make a mistake. Like, I, you don't really ever see refs or judges, especially judges, ever explain their work. You know, they never have to show their work. Now, with refs, like, what happens if you do make a mistake? Like, and you feel like, like, what happens then? Do you apologize to the fire? Do you talk to the fire? Do you talk to the commission? What happens if you do make a mistake? All right, look, Matt, great question. I'm going to set you an exercise here, okay? You can go and Google my name, and you can Google Mark Goddard, and Mark Goddard speaks, Mark Goddard apologizes, etc. Like I said, I've been doing this for, for 20 years, thousands of, upon thousands of fights. I am not perfect. 
the word perfection doesn't exist for me. But I tell you something, every time I step into ref, that's what I'm trying to be. I know I can never be perfect, but I'll tell you hand on heart, every time I step into ref, it's, it's exactly what I want to be. And of course, I've made errors of judgment, I've made mistakes. And you'll find articles where I've publicly spoke out about that. I would, I would admit I've made a, a, an error, I've made a wrong call. It's funny, here's a prime example, and I've got one half of them right here. Mike, do you remember when you fought Danny Roberts in uh, Manchester? Yes, sir. D Danny KO'd um, Danny, uh, sorry, Mike KO'd Danny in that fight. Um, and there was an, uh, it was actually at the end of the fight, I'll use this as a prime example, you can look it up, you'll see it. At the end of the fight when, when, when Danny had won, uh, sorry, when Mike had won, Danny went down and I saw his hand come up and I I overstepped the mark, or should I say I understepped because I believed he was still in the fight. He wasn't. I should have stopped that fight right there. Mike done what he was supposed to do. He got one or two shots off more before I'd stopped the fight. And I felt absolutely dreadful about that. Terrible. And and I had spoke about it publicly. Um, there was another famous incident, a high pro you know, this is the thing we say high profile. Nobody wants any profile, let alone high profile. But again, goes to show you'll find me, there was the third fight with uh, Daniel Cormier and Stipe. I'd done the first, uh, I'd done one and three, Herb done the one in the middle. But the third one was in the in the apex during the pandemic. And there was an eye poke, a particularly bad eye poke. And I missed it. And you'll see me afterwards, obviously. And again, I felt dreadful. I'd spoke to, I'd spoke to uh, uh, Daniel and his team, and I'd apologised. I'd ap apologised publicly. And here's the thing, Matt. Did you know, or do you know? There's a reason why not many. I kind of booked the trend. We're not allowed to speak. We're a, we we can be punished for speaking. A lot a lot of commissions and stuff like that, which I understand because. If you're having somebody speak on behalf of the sport, you've got to be careful on, on who that is. Mm -hmm. But there's a reason why a lot of officials are just, you know, they're, 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 I wouldn't say scared's the right word, but they're, they're too damn weary uh, to, to speak because the, there is a, a fixed resilience on officials being allowed to, to, to speak and talk. And that's generally why you won't see it. But if I've had, like I said, coming from the heart, every, the that everything does in this sport. If I've made a mistake or a sore fight and potentially to get unnecessarily hurt, I am going to speak about it and I have done and you'll find me publicly. You know, like I said, I have made mistakes and I've made errors of judgment because that's the way the world works, unfortunately. The, 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 the trick for me is in so many thousands of fights to keep that retention rate of a, a mistake very small and I, and, I, and I think I have. But if I have made calls and bad things, you will find those out there in the public domain, especially from me. I respect, respect. that big time, man. You've become, yeah. um, you know, we used to have like Big John McCarthy. We had, it's like if a ref is good, you usually don't really see them that much. But like you and Joe, uh, Joey Beltran, Mike Beltran, Mike why did I say Joey? Yeah, I went with the BKFC fire. Yeah, Mike Beltran, of course. You two have become, uh, Two of like the face of refs now, you know, like Herb Dean's always probably been one of the biggest ones. Now it's you, man, and I, you know, you don't really see much, uh, much hate towards Mark Goddard because we all can tell Mike Beltran and Mark they don't take no shit in there, and that they're there to, you know, just do their job and they don't, they don't play favorites. You know, we don't, have, you guys aren't Mazagatis. Um, I mean, I appreciate the coup. Yeah, Mike's, Mike's my boy. Mike's, uh, we're very good friends. Um, and uh, honestly, um, I mean. With your thought of me not getting shit, <laughs> I wish that was the case. But hey, guess what? Never in person. Never. Yeah. In oh person. no, of course you're a big <laughs> dude. You're a big you boy. Yeah. <laughs> You've, yeah. I, I've had my fair share of um, comments. Of loads. Oh of yeah. That, you know, and you know oh, what yeah. it's like, Mike. You know what it's like as a high-profile yeah. fighter. You you know what it's like oh, and what yeah. people do and say. You just gotta. Oh, I had a. I had an. an uh, analogy for it, like a way of dealing with it, because you can't get into it with these people, you know. They're, and here's the thing I said, most fans, they're just that, they're fans, they're good people. All the people mm -hmm. that go to events, they're true fans, they're supporters, they spend the hard-earned money to come and watch people like Mike and all the other stars fight. That's what you call a fan. All the other fucking nerds and dorks 
that sit at home illegally streaming. They've never been to an event. They'll never go to an event. Mm -hmm. So their reaction and their dopamine rush is by trying to interact with fighters and officials and stuff online. And you've just got to kind of, when you know that I'm still convinced, I'm majorly convinced that the vast majority of people, they're just good people and they don't tweet. Mm -hmm. The, yep. the reason it sometimes it feels overwhelming is because nerds, dicks, and assholes have to tweet. So it seems like there's a rush, but they are far outweighed by the good people that just either, you know, either they don't get to a, Sometimes these events are expensive things. Um, but like I said, the vast majority of people, the vast majority of people, they're just good everyday people and, and, and their fans and supporters, whether they're at the event or not. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, so recently I was at KC and uh, oh, Beltran, Beltran was giving me and my wife, like he gave us these peanut butter, almond butter pretzel bites. Was We was back there like we ain't have nothing to eat. We were sitting there watching the fights and he's like, here, grab some, man. I'm sitting there taking some pretzel bites from him, uh, hooked us up. But like my point is, you guys do, you guys aren't, are you specific to UFC and are you guys technically part of the commission? Because you guys work for all the events. You guys work. A matter of fact, you're not specific UFC. You, I've seen you ref other fights in yeah. what, Russia, all over the place, Strike Force, different organizations, all types of different organizations. So, like, are you guys. How are you guys connected? Are you commissioned? Yeah, we're completely freelance. We are official. Refs and judges are completely independent contractors. Oh. Um, so we work, like I said, you'll see me work for all over the world for different promotions, Cage Warriors, KSW, Octagon, UAE, uh, you know, Bellator, PFL, obviously the UFC. The, the only place that the commissions come into, the commissions are like the intermediaries, you know, like a, a body in between the promotions and the officials. And that's generally, it's a US-led thing. There are commissions in other countries in the world, but yeah, by and large, we're completely independent and that's why you're Kind of like it. fighters? So fighters are independent contractors in a way. Yeah, but you're locked in. Like if you're signed to the UFC, you're not fighting for anyone else. It's right, a, it's completely. You know, you're locked in. Right, for, for from a performance perspective, you're locked in. We're independent in as much as, like I said, we can be hired by any commission or any promotion around the world. Well, so that okay. leads me, Mike. If I could stack onto that question, that leads me to uh -huh. how, how how do they? Because you are obviously one of the high tier. You know, to get Herb Dean, Mike Beltran, Mark Goddard on your card, do they bid for that? Like. How, how does it, yeah? How does how that come around? Cost, who pays yeah. the most? What promotions paying? Is the commission paying or the promotions paying? The money is the question. Yeah. That is what I want right. to do. Know you, do you do well. you have to just like uh, you know apply for it or do they go? We need you. You know, no, we'll they pay you get you bigger checks. Yeah, the, the promotions like the promotions will come after us. You know, generally where they are in the world, they'll come after us. Obviously, in the U.S. Like I said, the commissions are there. So they're the intermediaries. So if you're a lot, and obviously it's state by state, you know, mm -hmm. so you'll see us in multiple states because we hold licenses in multiple states. Um, you know, uh, obviously Nevada or California or Florida, New York, etc. Every time we work in a, an event in a state athletic commission, that's the body that comes and contacts us. We work via them. In, in other countries in the world or for other promotions, they can come directly to us. You know, they can come as an individual because there is no, uh, the, the, there's no commissions, there's no regulatory bodies there. So we can have a one-to-one -one with them directly and the relationship works like that. Okay. So, I mean, if it's none of my business, it's none of my business. But like, what's the most you've ever been paid for reffing? <laughs> that's <laughs> that's classified information. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah look, now here's the thing. Well, I'll tell you this now. Look, and again, it's public. Ref people can see because you know, if you see oh. me referee a world championship fight in the UFC, everyone knows what we get paid. It's public record because the commissions oh, okay. release it. You know, in Nevada, that, you can yeah. find that online, no problem. And here's the thing. I'm going to say two things, probably more than two things. One is 
if if anyone is thinking of being an official in MMA, please believe me, it's not for the money. And it's yeah. not for the... There's only a couple of them, myself and her. This is my job, it's my career. And, you know, I've had to work like a fucking dog to get to this position. No different to a fighter. You come in and you claw your way to the top. You don't start on a, on a multi, you know, a six-figure contract or whatever it may be. You've got to come in as... Mike Perry, who's a brand new fighter, etc. You go through the years, you do all the hard yards, etc. I've done all that, like I said, 20 years ago, working on events, you know. People have these wild ideas about we're flying around business class and first class and doing this and doing that. <laughs> Nothing could be further from the truth. But when it comes to, like I said, with the UFC, and one thing I will, I'll absolutely press upon, is the opportunity I've had and continue to get to work for all these other promotions around the world, that's because people knew me from the UFC. That was mm. the vehicle to, 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 you know, to, to put us in the spotlight. There was, and, and I'm forever thankful for that, you know? So if I never refereed in the UFC, no one would have any idea who I was. The fact that I do do that, you know, from, from, a, from a profile perspective, that's who people get to know who the officials are and what the officials can do outside of that, you know, with other promotions and, and working hard and carving out their own opportunities, good for them. Just, uh, like I said, I'm very mindful and thankful of the fact that without that platform, nobody would have a single idea who I was. Well, and that's interesting because, <clears throat> you know, in other sports, like we know in baseball, like Angel Hernandez, like he's kind of famous because he's so dog shit. Right, like he's just known as being so bad. <laughs> I don't know. And who that like, is. yeah, good. He's terrible. But uh, in, in MMA, especially UFC, like there's some boxing refs. I guess people know because that one guy's clips go viral every once in a while. But in the UFC, it's almost like you guys, like referees, are essentially stars too. You know, like my girlfriend started watching UFC just a couple months ago for the first time, and she knew Mark Goddard and Mike Beltran before she could name like most fighters. You know, and we saw you at the Karate Combat event. She wanted a picture with you because you're a recognizable face. That's got to be kind of a rare thing in sports. Like, wh what do you think about you? You get what I'm saying, right? You know, like, man. yeah, it's a good and it, it's a good point. And here's the thing. And again, I'm a thankful for it. Of course, I am because without the UFC. I wouldn't have got to where I am now. I wouldn't have got to make a living out of uh, out of you know my passion. I, I, I make a living. It's how I feed you know my kids, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But and here's the thing: it's like anything. It's the same as fighters. You know, this is what. And yes, the the referees get notoriety. I don't know how that happened in our sport because you got other like in the UK football. You know, soccer is the biggest sport by a country mm -hmm. mile. Um, People, gen people will tend to know who the referees are, um, but but they're, it's not like it is in MMA. I don't know yeah. how it's got like that, you know, and I don't know how it's got like that. And it's, the, the thing it does is it creates a lot of resentment. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. that, that's what people see. But again, I'll come back to the point. By and large, most of the time, it's the same as fighters. Mike. You know, if you start getting, you start getting famous and getting a profile, etc., Sometimes, you know, you're going to attract negative um, fans, should we say, or negative attention. But by and large, look, it's a very positive thing. Who the hell am I to yeah. complain? Because I'm in a very fortunate position. Um, I'm not lucky. I, I always say the term, there's a difference between luck and fortune. But um, mm -hmm. I, I'm always extremely thankful. Um, every, every event. And here's the thing, you know, as a referee... Any event could be your last. You know, you just don't know. I'm on this ride, like I said, of MMA. It's almost 25 years for me. 20 years as a ref. 16 years of those being international. And I'm still cherishing every moment. I get to all these magical, you know, stadiums and events and places all over. I've been around the world and back again twice. And uh, it's an, uh, for me, it's just how can I be nothing other than thankful for that and that's all i am the stuff that comes with it you know people say i'm not i'm not even remotely famous not even close to the word famous if you follow a sport or a particular genre yes you may know me and that's it and i'm comfortable with that 
Well, I feel like that's how it happened, right? Is you guys sacrifice a lot of your own time on, you know, we see you at every show. We don't see the fighters at every show. We see a fighter uh, twice a year, maybe, and on an event and they're performing. But we see you guys at 16 different shows throughout the year. And, um, you know, the, the UFC gives you your moments to where, you know, right before the fight, oh, this is our referee in the ring tonight, or John Anik, always, you know, best seat in the house. And, you know, so have you used any of that fame to, you know, fame to do anything outside of your job as a referee? Like, uh, do you have businesses or, or are you dabbled? You know, what what doors is your foot in as far as financially, business wise? Not from the back of MMA, Mike, to answer the question. Everything, everything I do now is related to MMA. There's offshoots and things like when I'm training officials that, you know, that that's a good one. If I do a referee and judge score for training officials and obviously I'll travel to different countries to do that for the groups. You, you could class that as a, as an offshoot. But I had, um, it was only since 20, it was 20, end of 2018, beginning of 2019. It's really only in the last six years that I've been MMA specifically. I had, uh, I had quite a high, uh, believe it or not, there's, 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 there's half a brain in this head. And I had a very successful commercial job, um, uh, side by side with, with, with MMA and the, the two of them kind of worked so well because the, the company I worked for had customers worldwide and obviously when I was traveling with the UFC I, I was getting to do both things at the same time it just worked perfectly you know it worked for me um, but it got to the point where I was presented with an opportunity to be able to you know I mean like, like I said how can how can I not be thankful for that 20, 2019, I took the decision to leave the corporate, the commercial rat race, and just make MMA my full time thing. And and I've been successful enough, you know, to do that. And and that's what I'm doing now. But in answer to the question, um, I put everything everything I do outside of MMA is kind of related to MMA. If that makes uh, if that makes sense. Yeah. The, the perfect one is being the officials training. If I'm not training officials, and I'm in the good spot of looking for weekends off, not on. You know, that that's a good thing. If I'm busy, generally I'm booked. I've got dates three, four, five months in advance. Um, and then I'm trying to navigate and, and, and try and find some time off in between. So ultimately, you know, yes, I'm in a good place and, and comes back to me without being boring about saying it. I'm, I'm thankful for it. Very. Quick one going into your instructionals. Uh, ha- just for like the average fan, I feel like we get asked this a lot, and I have a couple important questions for you, but you know we'll rattle those off. But how do you uh, become a ref in in the simplest terms? Like for people, because people ask that shit a lot. They think it's really easy, and it's not. You got to get. Let's hear it. <clears throat> oh yeah, good. I, it's one of the most commonly asked questions. And here's the thing: a lot of people, a lot of people want to or think they can be a referee. Fucking everybody, everybody thinks they're a judge, okay? Let me make that distinction (laughs) right now. A lot of people want to be a referee. Everyone thinks they're a judge. A lot of people look at the referees and they see, like, if you make a call and then the the shit starts online, and I'm not too sure about that. But everyone thinks they're a referee. Uh, Sorry, a judge. But here's the thing I say to people. Like, for some reason, again, there's, there's this weird notion in MMA they think it's just something you can have a go at, you know, think something you can pick up and do without, you know, any necessary or, or anything in the past. People always talk about, do you have to have been a fighter to be an official? Categorically not. I'll put that one to bed right now. But if you, a lot of people come to me and say, I don't train in martial, I don't do this. And I'm like, well, you know, if, if you're not active in any facet of the sport, you may find this, you know, a struggle. And you're trying to explain to people, it's like when I do a seminar or if I say, as an example, if I spent one weekend with a fireman, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, am I out on fucking Monday morning climbing ladders, putting out fires? No. I have to go through, there's two things you can never bypass for any job. 
is time and experience, and they both work hand in hand. You can't work, you can't have one without each other. So when I kind of I'm trying to explain to people, look, you got to start off at the bottom if you want to be a ref or a judge. Number one, you got to try and carve out the opportunities, get out there into your local events, start small, start local, and just enjoy the process. Don't try and rush it. And if you cut corners like anything, same as a fighter, Mike, right? You got a guy in the gym. He's had two amateur fights. He's six months into a career. He thinks he's fucking Rocky Marciano. Jumps in out of his depth, has a bad experience, and then realizes, shit, this is not what I was supposed to do. Just I try and tell people to settle down, take as much time as you can, get on a recognized course with a, a recognized uh, official or a referee, and just just enjoy the process. You know, work hard because you have to, especially as an official. You know, and just. Just take your time, and that's the same as any job. I can't, I can't bypass time or experience because I'll get caught out. Mike, if you don't mind, let me let me throw two out there. So our producer has a clip he wants you to react to. It's a famous one. We'll just do that after you answer this because you kind of forayed into what I was going to ask you. Judging, have you ever? I, I don't know what you can or can't say. What you're comfortable saying, but we've seen some fucked up. Like, you know, the judges in MMA, a lot of us know those names, too. They fuck it up a lot. You ever held up a hand and been like, what the fuck? And, like, why <clears throat> could you eventually become a judge? You know, like, what do you think about judging? Do you have any er interactions with them? Like, you know, just your of, thoughts, uh, man. You of of course. I mean, I, I am a judge. I do judge. I teach judges. I teach go. referees and judges. Um, let, let me tell you something now. Um <laughs> The, the despite what people think, judging now and MMA officiating now is better than it's ever been. I can tell you that now. Yes, mm -hmm. you are going to get contentious decisions. Yes, you're going to get... But the biggest... One of the biggest problems we have with, with MMA judging is misconception. People mm -hmm. hear things in certain ways and they, they just dive down a rabbit hole with them. They take no time to understand. Honestly, it's misconception. Here, here, I'll put it this way. So many times I've had interactions with fans or even reporters. They're, they're a good one. Media. These guys who are paid to write about what they're saying. So they're like, oh, this guy, and he done that, he got it wrong. And like, okay, cool. Well, here's a pen. You're now sat in the chair. Can you tell me how you judge a fight? Come on, talk me through the criteria. And they don't know it. You know? Hmm. Obviously... And, and that, that's what frustrates me and my colleagues. And yes, you said about, do I know them? The judge, of course, we're all friends together. The, the, there's a select band at the top, you know, these guys, and mm -hmm. we're all friends together. And I can tell you, hand on heart, you know, the amount of time and dedication. People think that the, we, these people just turn up and they don't care. And that nothing yeah. could be further from the truth, Mac. I, I promise you that nothing could be further from the truth. The trouble is, is... When people see something or they perceive something, you got to try and cut through all that noise. And here is a classic case in point: the word robbery. How yeah. often do you hear that word? Every How time there's a every time someone loses five bucks on a parlay. Yeah, correct. Do you know what robbery means? Do you know what the translation for robbery means in MMA terms? It means close fight. It means yes. close <laughs> fucking fight. That's yeah. what it means. It means that a judge could have seen one round. Don't forget there's three judges in three separate uh, fields of vantage. They could mm -hmm. have saw something. They could have heard something in a super close competitive fight where you could make a case either way, 29-28 either way, or 47-46 um, uh, either, whatever it was, 3-2 to two or 2-1 two to one, either way. But that term, it's just, that's it's the crazy well. thing about, that's the crazy thing, that's the frustrating thing. But it's not just MMA. Look, you go to a soccer field or a baseball field, mm -hmm. you got 40,000 umpires sat there, right? Everyone yep. knows what they're doing apart from the people that are paid to do it. You just got to calm everything down, allow common sense to take over, and please believe that the sport's evolving, you know, as a whole. The fighters are evolving, coaches, training methods, everything. And so is MMA officiating. But I will tell you, at the top... With the guys, the dedicated guys, it's better now than it's ever have been. Well, I think that's a interesting point you just brought up because I knew that because 
I've worked next to judges at the karate combat events, and you got one sitting next to you, and the other one's across the cage. So the points of view, like I think most people don't know that they think they're just sitting three in a row next cool. to the commentary team. Yeah, like chatting. No, that's a good point. Like you might have one judge sitting there watching, you know, someone get cage controlled different right angles. there. Yeah, different angles. Different so that's angles, yeah. that's an or interesting they point. Hear something different. Uh, yeah, could, something as close as that. Mike. You dig, you dig a liver shot into somebody, Mike. And you, the judge is that uh, I hear him struggle for breath. Mm -hmm. it, when there's 20,000 people in an arena, the two people on the opposite side, they're not going to hear that. But you could be the one judge that heard that and you think, fuck, that was the most valued strike of the, of the round. It was a super close competitive round. Mm -hmm. And that's what swings it the other way. And obviously when you have that, just a one point difference that creates a split and then everybody's jumping up and down. Judges will... We want to be uniform. We would love every decision to be unanimous. But unfortunately, the world doesn't work like that. And judging isn't an exact science. It can't be an exact science. You have to have, you have to have, it's all about the people that are in the chairs. You know, the, the comp competent, experienced, educated people to get the best results. That's it. I feel like we just stumbled wow. upon a nugget there of, you know, uh, perspective. Yeah, three different angles. All right, let's pull up this clip uh, Jazz wants, wants you to react to. Let's see here. <laughs> we all remember this. It's all over! Just like that Charlie Ward! Oh, gosh. And then he worked the shot that dropped Redman. Seconds left to go in the round. Why did he get so mad? In the celebrate with us. The nope. notorious one. Wow, Conor McGregor trying to go at the referee. See, Mark, don't take no shit. I don't know what's going on here. Who's the bodyguard now? But Conor McGregor going after the ref. I didn't see any problem with that stoppage. I don't know what he's upset about. What are you doing, Jazz? What the fuck? What are you bringing that up for? <laughs> Come on, man. You sound like a fanboy. Give me a real question. <laughs> oh, man. I, you know, you handled yourself very well in that situation, uh, which, you know, makes me think. Uh, and also, this has been a very knowledgeable episode uh for us man we've i've learned a lot today talking with you um you know if and i know that in the uk fighting in the streets is like a popular thing it's like y'all do that a lot you go to the pub i don't know if you drink or what but if what is your art of choice if you had to defend yourself Oof. i'll tell you what my <laughs> You Are you a to... boxer? Are you a grappler? A wrestler? A kicker? Very good, um, well, people know me from jiu-jitsu and wrestling, but, you know, the fact of being a martial artist, here's the thing, mate, you know yourself, because I'm talking to one right now. It's funny because me, I've told you before, like, me and my friend, like, especially when you went over to Bare Knuckle, if ever it was a sport invented for one person, you <laughs> fucking found it. You know what I mean? I mean, you find your calling, mate, and you've killed it, stone dead. Look, look, look at what you've done. Honestly, Thank it's amazing. You. But I'm trying to say to people, and when I say to people like you, Mike, this will come right full circle. When I say, like we, me and my friends say, you're a dog, but we mean that in the truest, the, the the fairest sense, the truest sense, and the nicest sense. Like you have an ingredient that you can't teach. You'll know what I'm talking about. I could put you in a gi and put you in martial arts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but you're still going to be what you have within is you, because you have that, you have that, that X factor. And when you're talking, if you're talking about street fights, here's the thing: I know there is where I'm from in Birmingham, like I said, and where I was from originally, was born in Glasgow, the fucking ghetto, ghetto. I've had friends who have been lifelong martial artists. I drop them in a real scenario in the street. Gone. Nothing. Useless. I have friends, associates, who've never stepped foot on a mat in their life, but I could take them into a certain situations and watch them wreck shop. That's all I'm going to say. I think it comes down to the, the individual and obviously... Uh, now, if you have both, if you're a little bit, you know, contained within and you do know martial arts, I think you're in business, you know, it's a backup. Having martial arts is a backup. 
But, you know, for me, like I said, I try and explain that the, the real world, the ring and the cage and the mat and the dojo is not the real world. And I've mm. seen, like I said, I've saw so many lifelong martial artists, accomplished martial artists go to absolute pieces, terrorized and they're, they're frozen on the spot. Then I've got mm. little nasty, gnarly fucking head the ball Jack Russells who were <laughs> never done a martial art in their life, but they can just uh, they're just equipped differently. You know what I'm talking about, Mike. Pretty smart. Do you ever... You I mean, see, that's hard for me because your response is like, you know, me, I learn a lot about life from martial arts. I feel like martial arts teaches me so much about being a human being or dealing in situations or, or how to act. You know, like, there, for example, there was this guy, I pulled out, uh, I turned right at a red light. And you can here in the States. And uh, a guy pulled out of the gas station right on the other side of that road. And he pulled out and drove as fast as he could. He was just, he was mad because he was going to work construction that day or something. And I was in a rental and, and he's honking at me and he pulls like he was trying to like hit my car, hit the car. And I'm honking at him and he stops next to me and we roll the windows down and he was livid he was so mad and i didn't even do nothing bad like that i didn't even do nothing wrong at all really i drove out i did i we went out at the same time and you know what i did i was like i was like he's so confident i was like you got a gun huh he was like huh he heard that i said the word gun so he's like huh and i'm like i said you got a gun over there huh and he's like, it's Florida. I'm like, well, go to work, bitch. <laughs> Shut up and go to work because I'm not, you ain't going to get out the car and fight me. And I'm not trying to get shot. So go have a good day, bro. Yeah, you, you know, see, there's a different, uh, uh, what I will say for that guy, you know what we call that? We call that a lucky day. It's yep. a lucky um, day. <laughs> yep. Because if he does, if he does get out to fight, he, well, we, we know the rest, but what yeah. you have in the in the U.S., like you said, depending on what state you're in, you have you have the equalizer. I don't have to fight, and that, that that's a different <laughs> thing. But yeah, look, the thing about martial arts, of course, it does humility, resilience. I'm the same. I'm driving in traffic. If I'm not, I've said it before. You know, people driving erratically and stuff like that. I'm like. The people, you know yourself, mate, the last thing I want to do when I'm out is have any form of confrontation. The last thing, because we, we know what the net result's going to be. Mm. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'm the pacifier. I would try and defuse a situation before I'd have to handle it physically. Um, of that, that, that's the way it is. Of course it does. Everything begins and ends up here. Um, but, yeah, it's, it, when we, we could, I could tell a million and one stories, and I'm sure you could too. Of well, well, can you give us before you go? Can you leave us with one, one good one? You've seen a thousand, thousands of things in the fight game. What is one story that stands out for you that you would tell our listeners? Shit. In relation to what we just talked about, or you mean just in general? Well, let me stack on. Let me stack onto it too. Yeah, go because ahead and stack it, Mac. Bro, okay. So, Mark, you're you're a ref. You see a fight bust out. What you guys were just talking about in the street? Does it ever kick in where you're like, oh, I need to go officiate that? And you're like, all right, boys, like settle your shit. Or, or like, are you like, I get paid for that? I'm not doing that right Perfect now. I'm not on story. the clock. Perfect story, and it's going to answer to Mike's question as well. I'll give you. Uh, I'll give you an exact real life scenario. Let's go. There was a show I was at in in the UK a few years ago. Um, very well-known events and in, in international, it's a European event, international event. They came over to do a show in the UK. Uh, you know, like I said, there's a lot of pissed up people. You know, pissed in pissed in the UK means drunk, doesn't mean angry. But in this, but in in this context, they were both. And I came out of the, the this event, and they were fucking hammered, like even more than normal. I tell you, the night it was. It was the night when Connor fought Habib. So I think it was October. So four or five years ago, uh, you know, uh, to, yeah, I, yeah. I think it was October. I was there. It was that night. So we're, we're at this show in London. I come out. 
It's fucking carnage. It's like, it's like a Western. Two girls start fighting, okay? Two pretty, really pretty girls. They start tearing into each other. We're walking past them. I go, come on, stop, stop. So stop that. And, of course, when you do that, then you're inviting all, you know, the bravado of the other guys. So the guys tried to jump in. There was a, a, a colleague of mine, a referee, much smaller than me, and he tried to split it up as well. Some big lumps come over. He started throwing shots. My man's fuck. He's like Penel Whitaker, mate. He's fucking. <laughs> he's bobbing and weaving all around in the street. This one guy. That, that, then all hell breaks loose, um, and the guys come to try and sideswipe me. He's tried to Judas me from the. So we say Judas. He's trying to hit you when you're not looking. Um, that's a real life scenario. How it ended. Look, I'm here smiling, and so was my pal. How it ended. I'll tell you in person. Or I'll put it in the book, but that was the, that was one of the times you know MMA related when unfortunately you come outside and answering your question, yeah, you saw fights. I tried to break it up with the best of intention, and then it went a certain way. And uh, let's just say we had a good night afterwards. We were drinking beer and watching the fights. Snatched, <laughs> snatched his neck or something. Hell yeah. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. It's so great to hear, man. So great to hear from you. Um, can, can I can I throw uh, one more out there? I'm still course. trying, and I don't know if you if you just didn't want to answer, like I, because dude, if you don't, we can cut anything out. But so when, why why is how am I? I'm trying to word it right. So I'm so sorry. Mike's gonna start laughing. But why? How do they get you? Like, cause you, I'll see you at a karate combat event. The next day, you're you know at the UFC. Next week, you're in KSW in Poland. Mm. How do you get picked to be? Because you're a top ref. Everyone wants to use you. How do organizations like convince you to come out there? Like, who flies you out there? Like, do you have to fly yourself out there and apply to be in the like? How does that work? Do you get what I mean? You're a top roster pick for. How does yeah. that happen? So, whoever you work for, the promotion that you work for, regardless of commission or not, the promotion are responsible financially for for you uh, flying mm -hmm. you out there. Um, obviously putting you up, putting you in a hotel, uh, feeding you, and then paying you your fee. So the, whichever promotion it is, whether you deal directly with them or the commission deal directly with them, those are the ones responsible for your accommodation, your travel, your fee. Everything comes down solely to the promotion that you're working for. So when you'll see me in any KSW, Octagon, or in India, or UFC, whatever, I mean, the UFC is... Their travel department is huge, you know. Mm -hmm. Look how many people, how many hundreds of people they're flying all over the world in any given week. Um, so in general, yes, whichever promotion you're working for, that's the people that will, will, will expense your trip and, and they're responsible for doing that. And then they present you like to the commission and go like, we want him. Yes, and then the commission the goes, you're in town, you're good. Yes. Yeah, or the commission, obviously the dates will, will be stacked in advance and then the commission, like I said, which is mainly, by and large, a US thing, the commission can contact you directly. Once the commission's, like if I'm working in Las Vegas, they say, Mark, boom, you're working UFC 300. So six weeks before, they go, Mark, you're working UFC 300. They then tell the UFC, UFC travel department gets in touch and everything flows in that direction. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. I appreciate that a lot. I've always wondered that. Well, well, thank you so much for your time today, Mark. Uh, our our producer said you had, you know, like forty minutes. So uh, I think we've reached that. I don't know if you if you got to go. Uh, what time is it over there right now? Because like I'm teaching. To, what, what did your producer tell you, Mike? Did he tell you that we'd arrange <laughs> a certain time? Is this jazz? Is this the same one? Yeah. It's like the Conor McGregor trip. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> I'm actually teaching tonight. Thursday nights is my night for teaching. It's 6 p.m. over here now. Um, and I'm okay. teaching. That's why I said if we start at 5, I could give be here for an hour and a half. But the fact we start late, it's just because on a Thursday night when I'm at, when I'm at home, I'm teaching at, at, at my local gym, GB. Nice. Teaching refing or teaching martial arts? No, I'm teaching uh, jujitsu, jiu wrestling for jujitsu tonight. Oh, you actually you coach fighters and have. A, don't that, coach fighters anymore. No, I just, no. I just, just self defense. 
I just I teach for I teach at my friend's gym. Gym, so I teach jujitsu, wrestling. I'll do privates for people, etc. But I, uh, like I said, when cut a long story short, over ten years ago, once the refereeing really took off, I can't be around coaching fighters because I'd have fighters okay. that will go to the conflict UFC. of interest. Exactly that, and, and you can't do uh, that. I was going to say you got, you got to keep it. You got to keep everything. Referees on a lower tier could probably get away with it, but you know the level that myself or Herb or Beltran, Herzo, those people that we can't be directly involved with fighters. Plus, Mike, you'll know. I know for myself, fighters are a fucking pain in the ass, right? <laughs> Some of them. Some of Some them. Some of us are better than others. Uh, I believe that. Wait, so I don't want my coach to leave me the hell alone. He got to bother me. I'm like, leave me alone, bro. I told him yesterday. I was like, I'm not picking up the phone no more, bro. You're trying to wake me up on sparring day. I was trying to sleep in today, calling me twice, texting me. Oh, man. I told him. But I, but I when do you fight next? Him. Yeah, I'm fighting. Jake so, Paul. Yeah, I'm fighting Jake oh, Paul July yeah, dude. 20th. Now... I was going to say, because I was thinking about it, you know, you I know you've refed uh, Tyron Woodley's fight or or an Anderson Silva fight, you know, and they went in there and boxed Jake and, and they didn't have a fair shake. But I've been doing the bare knuckle boxing, and I think with a 10-ounce glove on, I'm going to punch that kid pretty hard, man. Uh, I don't know if you – no, because you only – you strictly MMA, so you haven't seen a um, – you haven't done a Jake Paul fight, but – I mean, he's done. He's done good. He's gotten some attention, which is only going to get me attention when I go in there and bust on this kid. Because I'm telling you, bro, I fought three hard men last night. No Diddy, uh, and you know, at, at the spar, at the sparring at the gym. So I'm ready for this. July 20th. We got about 16 days or so. Of I'm course, in the ring with Jake bro. Paul, man. Listen, bro. Here's the thing. thing. And here's the thing. You fought Jake Paul. He can box. You know, he's, mm -hmm. he's proved a lot of people that, but, and no disrespect to the people he's fought, etc. Obviously, he's gone a certain path. But it comes back to what I said earlier. That thing that I got. He's fighting yeah. somebody with a certain, a certain something within, which I think is, uh, which... could be his undoing, mate. I wish you all the yeah. fucking best, honestly. And Please, I have nothing, I, so this whole much, thing bro. about, you know, people say about Jake Paul, obviously he's brought a lot of attention and, money to the sport and listen this is prize fighting i hope you get as much money as you can as much as you can possibly make to to to, to take this fight but there's one thing he's in for like i said uh, me and all my friends say it, mate every time every time you fight i said it when i remember when when you were fighting uh, luke rockhold no disrespect look, look at luke one of the most accomplished you know, former world champion, one of the most accomplished MMA fighters of all time. And I called it, you know, I said, I said you, you're dealing with a different animal. It's a mm -hmm. different sport, not too, uh, by and large, but you're dealing with a different animal. And I think that's what Jake's going to find out too, mate. So all the very best. Thank you so much, Mark. It, man, I'm honored, brother. I appreciate you so much. Let me leave, let, let's leave you with one last question. Are there any fires going back to, Two points ago, are there any fighters you will not, you can't, um, like ref? There is, and people don't know this. The, the, the certain fight. Here's a classic case. Another one, Le, Leon Edwards. Mm -hmm. you, you've ne you've never saw me referee Leon Edwards uh, in the UFC, and you never will. Why? Because I was Leon Edwards' first coach, MMA, way, way, way back when, when he was just an amateur, but. Again, the common sense element for me, like I said, even though the link is so, and um, who knew then when Leon yeah. first walked, in, that's another story, when Leon first walked into that gym as a raw amateur, a raw novice with no experience, now look at him. Well, UFC welterweight champion of the world. But you've never saw me uh, re referee him and you never will because we'll just keep it, you know, out the way. I just don't, I just don't want any hassle. And I don't want to be put in a predicament where I'm making a call that could go against him. So it's both ways. There's certain fights. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story because this has got out there too. Do you remember when um, when uh, Israel Adesanya fought uh, Pahaya for the second time in Miami? Yeah. I specifically requested not to do that fight 
and the because re- obviously I'd done the first, and the reason I requested not to do the fight was because I was thinking about Izzy, you know, I was thinking about him and me and him. Are, I've, I've been, I've refed him since. I've refereed his fight with Sean Strickland, but I actually removed myself because what I didn't want to do was for Izzy to have you know me walk into the dressing room. I was thinking of a fighter then. This is his night. It's all about him, and I didn't want to walk into that dressing room and him to have any any form of negative connotation or something like that. Um, so I decided, you know, I just thought the right thing to do and the fairest thing to do by him is just stay out of the fight, give it to another ref, and I requested from, from the commission not to do it. There's been things like that, um, and there's been a couple of instances where there's, there's certain fighters um, that I would rather not, um, you know, for, for, for personal reasons. Yeah, just experience again, it's just... We don't. I we never want to. I could appreciate. That. Yeah, we like never that. want to be the story, Mike. I never want to be the. My utopia in a fight is to say nothing, but like I said, we don't decide that the fighters do. It's their sport. I, I also try to to deal with the punches as they come, uh, whatever uh, type of shamas or shamas <laughs> or dark magic there might be involved. I try to accept it as it comes. And I, I stay focused, tunnel vision. That's what I've been doing the past three years winning. So I just stay focused no matter what. If I see something that gives me like a bad juju, I just, I try to change it. And I feel like that's what Pereira does with everything he says with Shama. It's like he's changing it to positive or he's changing a negative or he's changing a, po- you know, he's uh, he's making their positives negative and he's making his negatives positive. I I... I get it, but it's nice when when you don't have to do anything about it as a fighter and someone else had already thought about you. Yeah, and I, like I said, that was the case in point. Sometimes if I think, but that that's what comes with experience, you know. I'm just like, this is not about me, and I'd rather just, you know. Was it you? I'm sorry to interrupt. Was it you in the PFL when that guy had like a metal splinter in his foot or toe? Oh, in France. And you were like, come on and fight. And yeah, he was like... Something's on oh my yeah, foot. dude. Yeah, that that was me. That was the mm. Cedric Dumbay in the PFL. Mm-hmm. He had the he had a splinter. It was a wooden, it was a wooden splinter that was we found out afterwards. It was a wooden, like a little shard of wood that had gone into his. He big got toe. it in the fight though. He didn't have it walking into the arena. Well, no telling, no telling when he had gotten it. Yeah, there's the. I'm a professional, Mike. Uh, there's a lot more to that story than... Yeah, of more. course there's lots of details behind everything. That but, but one was a rough yes, one. It was, it, was a, it was a splinter in his toe. Um, and that's why the, the whole confusion about... Because I'm there thinking, you know, you know, it's like in a fight. Trying to say to him, you'll hear me say to him two or three, don't stop, you can't stop, don't stop fighting. I don't know. There's, I think he's broke his ankle or he's broke his toe or he's injured. Except I don't know what it is. I've just got a fighter pointing in his foot and holding it at a funny angle, even though I've told him he's got to keep fighting. It was it's just one of those things that was, it was a very unfortunate incident. You know, like I said, has to be the main event. Last round of a main event couldn't happen in a fucking prelim, could it? In the first round of a prelim has to happen in the, ma- it was a very unfortunate incident all around, but there was, it was a teachable moment. There was some lessons to be learned, like I said, with the parameters outside of that. That's mm. really all I can say right now. Well, so you said maybe hopefully that story's in the books, uh, in the book you talked about. You're writing a book? You're going to write a book? Yeah, just uh, lots of people, to, because I've got 25 years of, st- not about me, nobody gives a shit about me, it's, but it's what I've saw and what I've witnessed and, and, and like I said, traveling the, the world with this sport, with all the, like, you know, the crazy things and with, you know, your, your man just showing the, the Connor thing. And by the way, me and Connor were cool, 100% yeah. cool. I knew Connor as... As a, as a young, fresh-faced kid, when he when he came up through the ranks, me and him were entirely cool. Um, but just stuff like that, from my perspective, there's so much things that I've seen and witnessed around the world. Um, and like I said, in, in fairness, if I, if I'm gonna do like a, a a memoirs, if you like, then I think it's yeah. I, I don't know how long I've got left in the sport. Um, but I, I should be putting things down. So many people, like professionally, have been nagging me and telling me you've got to start doing this. And I think this year is the time to start and, and start putting stuff down before it gets, before I lose it in my memory. 
I'll buy 10 so, copies. So how does writing a book work? Do you literally write stuff down or do you do talk text and and then you put it into chapters? Yeah, I mean, you could. I mean, here's I've never wrote a book, Mike, I don't know, but I've got people who have offered to ghostwrite it for me. Mm. So I think that's what like, a lot of people so would do. So you would that. just talk to them yes. and tell them your story and yes. then they would write? Them are the guys that write it up for you so you can... Uh, just do sit down various sit downs of recordings do an hour here an hour there and then it just keeps adding up or you could just physically that. write it yourself but i'm not i don't have the my concentration span is wonderful for five minute segments anything you don't anything, have the capacity for that yeah I'm, I, I think i'm going to do a narration i'll just speak and get somebody to ghost write it i need to do that man but i need more stories man you got 38 years of stories, bro. I don't believe you're 50, man. You look too young. Ah, bought 1974, bro. That was my year of birth. I'm telling the truth. Good times. Good times. Well, Mark, we well, can't appreciate you, you enough, you man. Thank you for so, so much of your time, Mark. I really appreciate it, man. It's been an honor speaking with you. Uh, I know I learned a lot. I hope the fans did as well. Um, do you pick fights? How do you mean? No. Like, uh, do so, you... like, if we ran down a card, would you pick who you think you might win? I don't do predictions. Okay. For That's obvious reasons. Mm. For boxing, I will. And, Conley, yes, I'm, I'm predicting you to win. Let's go. That's all I care about. Let's go. <laughs> for boxing, there's, there's no conflict there for me. I'm predicting you to win, mate. Me and my boy, we're fans, bro. 100% we're fans. Well, I'm a fan of yours, too, Mark Goddard. Appreciate it. Next Best. time I watch you ref a fight, I'm going to be turned up on the TV, man. You <laughs> did. Sure. You remember the event? It was Poland. Because the same time, now I remember, when Bruce says, referee Mark Goddard, you fucking jumped out of your seat. Went, yeah, boy, yeah. Do you remember? <laughs> you did <laughs> okay. do that at the event. <laughs> that was the night I jumped on the cage for Darren. Yes. That was so it Darren was Poland. Till. It was Darren Till versus Cowboy. I read, that was the main event. I refed it. I cut, and you, you two were cutting a promo through the cage. It was Poland. M MMA math, man. Uh, it's not uh, Cowboy. Fucking Cowboy, man. <laughs> you know that that Fuck quickly, on a, you know that Darren's making his boxing debut this weekend, right? Mm -hmm. In Dubai. Oh, is he? Yeah, he's yeah. fighting in Dubai. Yeah. He's boxing in Dubai. I didn't Dubai. know that because I thought, I thought he was going to fight. Chavez Jr., and then I just saw that they switched it. It's going to be Uriah Hall versus Chavez Jr., and Darren was trying to get the winner uh, between me and Jake. That's the that's the money for But, yeah, I don't know what happened with the Chavez Jr., but the long story short, he's he's making his boxing debut this weekend in Dubai on a, a, good, oh, a good friend of mine's uh, Tam Tam. Tam, Tam oh, yeah. Khan's doing a promotion. It's a massive thing. It's called Social Knockout. I didn't hear anything about that. Yeah, look it up, it's, bro. It's, it's all over the internet. It's 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 there. Social Knockout is the event. Shout out to Tam Khan from uh, TKMA. Who's he fighting? Nobody? Somebody? I don't know who it is. I genuinely don't know. Yeah, who, it's who not. It it's not. I didn't recognize the name either. Yeah, I don't recognize the name, but I don't know if he's like from. I don't know if he's a boxer or a kickboxer or from, yeah. or, or from another combat sport. But if he wins and you win, that's the fight to make. It has to be. Isn't that the one fight in like MMA lore we have to have? I mean, we never got Tony versus uh, Khabib. We, you know, but that's the one. That's the one There's we can make. Chemistry with you two. It's the best. Well, I've been trying to look. I also have been trying to make that one. And Darren Till. Yeah, I don't know who the hell that guy is. The Mo Moody. Uh, yeah. Who knows? Interesting, but. You know, he said no to the bare knuckle shit. So, and he's a big, I put some weight on for this Jake Paul fight though, but, you know, I'm smaller. These guys, Jay, Darren's a big guy. What's the weight you're yeah. fighting at, Mike? What's the contract? 200, weight? cruiser weight, 199. Oh, wow. oh, you'll carry I'm your scared. power with you, right? You'll be happy with that. I'm telling you, man, I put I put 10 pounds of muscle on when they announced it. I, I've been eating, my, drinking my protein and creatine shakes after training. Um, and I definitely, like I said, I sparred three guys last night and two of them were heavyweights and one was a fast moving, you know, he's probably still like 185, but you know, the other two were 220 
and I carry the power. Uh, I I put the pressure on. I put you know my weight all over them. So I fight like a heavyweight, man. I'm looking forward to it, bro. Thank you, brother. I appreciate. It. Me too. I'm looking forward to doing it too. A lot of people. It's time. It's time to show them. You know, it's not that he ain't got it. What you're talking about? It's just that he's still green. I, you know, I had to go through a lot to get to this level of understanding of what I can do, my body, my martial arts, boxing, all my skills and abilities. I've been through, you know, 10 to 15 years of fighting at a high level. Yeah. Jake's been through two or three. And here's the thing, look. He, he listen. He's technically sound. He can box. No, two, this he can box. I don't care what anyone says, and he's proven that he can. He's technically proficient, but there's a difference, you know. Like I said, and so are you. There's, you're not. You're not just a fighter, but you're technically proficient too. But I'm going to yeah. emphasize the word fighter. That's mm-hmm. what I don't believe Jake Paul is. I think he's. Yeah done very well for himself. He's done very well for other people. You know, this is prize fighting. And uh, like I said, I don't believe, I don't think that Jake Paul is a true fighter. Maybe he is, till he's had his ass sat down on the canvas. Only then will we see what he's made of. You know, Mm. maybe he is. Maybe he is. It's unreserved and you, everybody knows, but maybe he is. I, I just don't think he's got that special ingredient. The dog. That's a good point. Can, can I leave you with? Oh, sorry, Mike. Go ahead. No, please. I was just, I was just saying. You know, uh, that's kind of what makes my uh, resurrection, if you will, uh, pretty great. Is that I've had lots of ups and downs and been through and and attempted large fights and and didn't show up for them the way I wanted to, but I always got in the ring. No matter how I felt, I always stepped in there and I fucking tried. And just that alone taught me so much. Um, you know, just only experience like that, you know, getting your face punched. The punches was never something that bothered me. You know, cowboy ripping my arm, trying to rip that thing off. He taught me a lesson there because there's other ways to win fights. and uh, And then, you know. That Jeff Neal won. I just ran. I just walked into a fucking kick, the hardest fucking kick you could walk into, bro. So, you know, just gotta take that, and learn from it, and move on. What were you gonna say, Mac? Uh, the Izzy thing. As a ref, you know, you said you you recused. I think that's the right word. Yourself from the second fight. You said I'm not gonna do the Perea second fight. Do you ever? leave a match and feel like you saved a fighter's career or you did something because i agree with the first stoppage and you might have been the reason you know if he took some crazy damage in that first one you let him go completely out maybe he doesn't knock him out the second time so you have a pivotal role in like these fighters you, you get what i'm asking man like uh 100 percent. i know exactly what you're asking and i'll surmise it like this i'm not there for my preservation i'm there for your fucking preservation i'm not there to preserve myself meaning that I'm going to watch you get clubbed to oblivion, potentially, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And we know it's a fine line. High stakes and highest prizes in the sport, world championship fight. I know how deep the water is that you're going to get out to. I'm going to watch you bob under the water. You're going to come back up. You're going to go under the water. You're going to come back up. When you go under the water, what I think could be for the final time, I've got to do my fucking job. I've got to do my job. And like I said... I'm all about, it's not my preservation or what I think people want to see. It's about your preservation as a fighter, more importantly, as a human being too. There you go. I love it. Yeah, that, our that's producer, Our producer, Jazz, did have a, another question I just remembered on, my, on our notes. And I'm wondering, if, is there anything that you would change in the sport? No, I've, I've, I think the rules are... Pre- it's funny because at this year's ABC, there's there's going to be a couple of proposed rules changes. Um, one is we're looking at um, um, 
proposing a, a new definition for a grounded fighter, trying to clear that one up. Oh, thank you. And, and then hopefully we can look at um, getting rid of um, a 12 to 6 elbow, finally. You know, it's a ridiculous... It's a ridiculous notion, but these things have to be, um, from the ABC Rules Committee, these things have to be presented, you know, officially. They have to be presented to the commissions. They have to agree and adopt these things. But but you'll see those at the at the next ABC that's coming up. in, And this happens every, every year at the ABC. There's always, from the Rules and Regulations Committee that I'm part of with a group of other officials, we, we try and put things forward that hopefully are going to bring the sport forward and make things easier to understand. All right. Uh, well, please, Mark, thank, but you've been so generous with your time, man. I hope you have a great night. Go and teach your classes, teach your people uh, how to defend themselves and enjoy yourself. I look forward to seeing you in the next UFC card and watching you referee, man. You're one of the nice best. Nice one, guys. All the best, bro. Thank you. Thanks Later, so Mark. much, brother. Good to see you, Mark. Take care, guys. Cheers. That was really good, dude. I mean, I feel like we learned a lot. Like, I know my questions can sometimes be, like, boring. No, bro, you did a fantastic fucking job, Mac. Fucking great questions. I love it because I also need, at times, I'm like, I need a, a different thought process here. And I'm like, insert Mac. Like, what are you going to say? And then you had great fucking questions today. Mark's... We don't get to talk to a ref no, a lot. No. So it's like, because they're so short. Like, they're, they they come in, they say, these are the rules, this is what it is. Any questions? And at the time, you're like, no. And no. then <laughs> you go fight, and then they go on. They're, they're in another country the next two days r- doing another fight. So yep. there's a lot of information there that, that we can get a hold of, but... What, what what can we run down and we finish this show off in a good way? Um, I mean, it was a good show. Mark was very knowledgeable. Is there, well, I mean, are there some cards? Are there some fights we nah, need to pick? There's, there's Darren Till this I, weekend. The ice bags. There's Darren Till this weekend. There's no UFC this weekend, I don't think. And then, when, I know. When, like, bro, what the I fuck is that? I didn't even know about no, Till. I know. Fight. And Who people have been kind of clowning. Fighting? Dude, the number one comment on social media lately has just been like the fall off has been crazy. And so like Darren, beat that boy up and then fight Mike. Let's get this shit done. Let's get this shit fucking done. You know, my my number one question for you, every podcast we're gonna do up until the fight is gonna be how's your training camp going? You told us earlier, so I don't really have anything besides that. I mean, how are you gonna spend July fourth, man? What what's your plans with your family? I'm about to go. I've been cleaning all day. I woke up early. I went and worked out. We did a killer workout. Me and the wife. The kids stayed asleep. Uh, my mom was here to if they woke up. Uh, did the workout. Come home. Swept. Mopped the floors and the whole house by myself. Uh, got in the shower with my wife. And... and uh, uh, then I pressure wash the couches and the doors and the windows in the back. Um, I do need to pull some weeds, but it's Florida. It's hot as fuck out there. And we're going to hit the grill. I'm going to turn the grill on, cook some burgers. Some I think I got the Wahlburger ones, which is interesting because where I worked out this morning, Mark Wahlberg is the founder of F45. Shout out F45 Claremont, man. We do. I love their workouts. It's really, they put like the exercises on the television Mm -hmm. that you can see the demonstration and then you do like X amount of stations and it's really good. And, um, got some people coming over, going to cook. And then when the sun goes down, I'm going to light up some sprinklers and fireworks for the kids and, I uh, didn't get nothing crazy. I live in my neighborhood's kind of crowded. I don't want to like burn a house down or have or the cops blow up call your hand. Or, yeah. Apparently, the good fireworks are like for sale everywhere now. They got they're just legal and for sale, but the cops still come and tell you, "All right, we're going to shut it down now." So uh, they're they're not going to do that with any sprinklers or anything like that. So, oh, what was the? Oh, I saw the meme. I, uh, uh, put it in reverse, Terry. Oh, yeah, that's Terry. A, I was going <laughs> to. Firework now. That's a firework now. <laughs> don't you be doing that because you can't be fucking up those hands. Those hands were diamonds, bro. You know, don't be out there blowing up those hands. Uh-uh. Those are worth money right there. Already. 
Look at him. Yeah, we don't need no fucking wraps and gloves. I'm fucking training my ass off, bro. I'm so fucking ready for this shit. I was learning some good shit last night on some fresh, large motherfuckers, and I felt really good about it. I'm gonna fucking crack Jake's nose. You know, I've been thinking a lot about when I told him, you're gonna be terrified on July 20th, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, what's there to be afraid of? But in the same interview with Ariel, he's like, you know, there's always the feelings of nerves and stuff when you go to do this. And and I talk about how I love that fucking feeling because I've learned, I've realized and, and learned how to enjoy that moment so much because you don't always get that moment. And it's always different. Any of the fights I've ever been in, that nerve-wracking moment before is always different. Sometimes I didn't have it, and it was probably my worst fight. This fight, I'm hoping I'm scared shitless of this stupid fucking kid. And I'm, and like Mark Goddard said, he can box. So don't try to take mm -hmm. it away from me when I go out nope. there and I beat the brakes off this man. Well, see, that's like where I thought Mark nailed it, like... That's it's that simple. I feel like Jake has clearly put in the time. I mean, when he knocked out Ben Askren, I was like, okay, that's never happened to Ben Askren. He's well, besides obviously a flying knee, but I'm like, uh, but he's not a boxer. But then uh, Tyrone Woodley, when that shit went down, I'm like, oh no, shit, that was this real. kid's serious, and he took a mm -hmm. fucking nasty shot from Tyrone. Mm -hmm. And so I just think Mark nailed it, bro. He's gonna find out, and I think he has to know, unless he has everyone around him gassing him up which i'm sure they are he has to know he's in a different type of fight this time i think that's why they picked you if you went from mike tyson to anybody else like darren till no go to mike platinum now i mean like let's see do you have that dog in you also someone that's not going to go away also considering my position in everything and fight game and combat sports right now as well after all my success over the past couple of years i've been winning they're like oh well, Jake did this to this, the, you know, these great MMA fighters, but Mike's been over here bare knuckle boxing. Mm -hmm. he, he hasn't fought someone like that that's proven tough like that. Yeah. In brawling standpoint. So I'm really looking forward to that. The time's ticking down, the clock ticks away, and I just get better and stronger every day. So. Oh, I know it, bro. You're going to whoop his ass. And I'm going to be there. I'm going to do my fucking best to be there. So. All right, man. Sounds good, bro. I'll well, be there. let's let's tell the folks uh, what they need to hear. Let them know, Mac. Thanks for watching, everybody. Um, happy Fourth of July to everyone who celebrates. You know, obviously, seventeen seventy six. Let's go. Uh, Mark said, "You're welcome, uh, dude." When you asked that, I was like, "LOL." <laughs> yeah. uh, but okay, yeah. There you go. Um, Really in-depth, cool, educational episode. Mark Goddard's a homie. Our boy Mike Perry here is going to go out and box Jake Paul, but we'll probably get one more, at least one more podcast in before then. Um, Mike, go enjoy some time with your family. I know you guys will all hear this a couple days later, but be careful with those fireworks out there, boys. And uh, Platinum Perry going to whoop Jake Paul ass. Let's go. Go follow hey, us on socials. Have y'all, yeah. have y'all, yeah, of course. Did, if they watch, then they're fucking following us. Yeah. If, um, did you watch any Love Island? Dude. <laughs> Dude, she was like, remember I texted you guys? I walk into the house. She's sitting there cracking up at the end of that episode. And yeah, we started Love Island. That shit's cancer, bro. <laughs> it's funny, though. Good. It's Good funny, for you, though. man. It's not cancer. Yeah. It's it's funny. It's it's where you can look at each other and appreciate each other for the way you guys act because you see these people acting ignorant or just unfaithful or untruthful. And see, so and good I think that was my beef with that shit. When she showed me that stuff before, I'd be like, you think I'm like these jackasses, you know? And like you said, we're still new in the relationship, but that is the way you should look at it. Like, aren't you glad you don't have to be on this shit? With these retards, I, you know, I get it, man. I uh, think, I, you know, I'd be looking at it like, damn, if I never got tatted, what if I would have met my girl on Love Island and we <laughs> did good and we were faithful to each other? Or, but everybody, and then they do these challenges with their sucking face. Oh, and, dude. Everybody's yeah. tongue and everybody down. And I'm like, that's a little, I mean, but as, 
I get it though. It's a mind fuck, dude. Like, what the fuck is this shit, bro? <laughs> like, yeah, I, it's life, bro. It's life. That's life, bro. And I'm glad that's not my life. I don't want to be on Love Island. I'm happy with my little Love Island I created. You know, we both met Amen. Latinas in New Mexico, so I'm happy with my choice. Yeah, mine. Mine's from Texas. Well, didn't you meet her in New Mexico though? I did Albuquerque. Yes, yeah, I did. the city of love. John liked John liked that AI one. <laughs> he did. He John laughed did at a that. Based on that one, that is. Uh, we got to get him my back wife, on here. My wife saw that. She ended up seeing that, and she sent it to me. And she's like, "I, you don't accept this." And then I was like, first look of at the all, comments." I was like, first of all, it's AI. Yeah, that's not a real person." Second of all, what about my response? Yeah, your response was response everyone was in the com- yes. I'm not starting a conversation with the bitch. What are you talking about, dude? That shit was fucking hilarious. I thought you nailed it. Uh, yeah, dude, go go enjoy the Fourth of July with Latori and the yeah. kids, and uh, give them a fist bump go, for me. I'm gonna go raw dog my wife. Yes, sir. Before you start edging on fight week. All right, boys. Overdogs out. Woo! <laughs> this podcast episode was brought to you by Overdogs Bet. Sign up today for early beta access and free play at overdogsbet.com slash beta.